Hi, all. Thank you for coming. I'm Mark Lagon, and I'm a, a concentration chair in the Masters of Foreign Service program. Um, MSFS is really happy to be a co-sponsor of uh, this series on global governance with the Mortara Center. Uh, and uh, for this a special treat today, the Global Human Development Program in the School of Foreign Service is also a co-sponsor. I'd ask you, as a matter of housekeeping, to silence your portable devices. Um, you can uh, give your rapt attention to this wonderful session for, for an hour and, and set that aside. We're probably going to have formal remarks till about 5.30, followed by Q&A, and we'll finish up around, around 6. Um, so today, it's a special pleasure um, for me, and I'm very glad that Kate McNamara uh, asked me to do this, to introduce a friend and colleague, Don Steinberg. Um, we had occasion to work together uh, at the policy planning staff for Secretary of State Powell and uh, discovered that uh, we were birds of a feather uh, when it came to working on issues of gender and uh, human rights and multilateral institutions, and I, I imagine that um, somewhere along the way, Don Steinberg will touch on those very issues today. Currently, he's the Deputy Administrator at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, he's running the place. Uh, he has a special interest and special focus on... <laughs> I always look for the person who's the number two. He has a special... Uh, Special focus on the Middle East and Africa. He's been working on this process of implementing the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review in which a plan was formed um, to knit together the work of the State Department and the lead development agency for the United States. Um, he's played a, a special role in the integration of gender and disabilities into agency's work and boosted the operational dialogue with all the partners who are so necessary to carry out a development policy, whether they be private sector, um, NGO, or international institutions. Um, before this role, Don was the um, deputy president uh, at the International Crisis Group, um, a really uh, remarkable organization um, focused on containing and uh, resolving deadly conflict. He also had been a senior fellow at the um, U.S. Institute of Peace. In a 30-year career with the government, a number of the stops in the way uh, that, that Don has uh, uh, played important roles in as Deputy Director of the Policy Planning Staff at State, um, the uh, serving as White House Deputy Press Secretary, <clears throat> the NSC's Senior Director for African Affairs, Special Coordinator for Haiti, U.S. Ambassador to Angola, a very interesting role as the, as the special representative for humanitarian demining for the president, and something of interest to our own Chet Crocker. He was officer in charge at the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria, South Africa, at the time of the country's transition from apartheid to democracy. Um, he has a master's degree in journalism uh, from Columbia University and uh, a master's degree in political economy from the University of Toronto, his bachelor's degree from the very creative Reed College. Uh, he's won a number of important awards, including the Presidential Meritorious Honor Award. Um, it is my special honor to introduce him to give a talk on development and global governance, and in particular, new approaches to development assistance to tackle the worst forms of poverty. So hold the applause till I'm done, please. Uh, Thank you very much, Mark, and it's an honor to be able to address this group. It's a particular honor to have uh, Chet Crocker here. Uh, I'm going to be talking a fair amount about peace and security in Africa, and I sort of feel like the man who was asked to talk about whale anatomy and looked out in the audience and saw Jonah sitting there. So I'm a little intimidated, uh, but uh, we'll proceed. Uh, Four days from now is my 60th birthday, and I got an early birthday present when uh, Barack Obama said in the State of the Union address, and I quote, the United States will join with our allies to eradicate extreme poverty in the next two decades by connecting more people to the global economy, by empowering women, by giving our young and brightest minds new opportunities to serve, by helping communities to feed, power, and educate themselves, by 
saving the world's children from preventable deaths and by realizing the promise of an AIDS-free generation. That's a pretty ambitious agenda, uh, you, might, you might imagine, uh, even if you've got 20 years to do it. But the beauty is that it draws on all of the things that my agency is involved with, uh, working with our partners in government, in the private sector, in non-governmental organizations, and most of all with countries around the world themselves. We are committed at AID to uh, using our development assistance in ways that create partnerships in integrating science, technology, and innovation into everything we're doing, into adopting a whole of society approach towards development, which draws on the contributions of women and young people and people with disabilities, the LGBT community, indigenous populations, and most importantly, by empowering local governments and civil societies uh, to perform their own development. This approach that we're adopting is not particularly new. In fact, it brings me back to my very first Foreign Service assignment. I was 22 years old and uh, empowered with a master's degree in political economy, some pidgin French, and I was sent out to the Central African Republic. And my first assignment was to put together a rural health program. Uh, why they decided that I was capable of doing that, I never understood. But they handed me $2 million and said, go, you know, start a health program in the province of Guam. So uh, I was a pretty imaginative young man and decided I'd actually go out there and talk to some of the people before we put the program together. And the first appointments I had were with government officials. And so the mayor and of the major city and the governor of the province and the military commander all told me that health really wasn't a serious problem in that region. What they really needed was $2 million to build an office building with air conditioning for government officials. Uh, so I, I sort of went to my Peace Corps volunteer friends and said, you know, is that right? Uh, and they took me out to the marketplaces, and they took me out to the, you know, venerable baobab trees that we all like to talk about. And we sat and talked with the women in the marketplace. And they had a, a very different vision. They said that their children were dying in vast numbers from what were essentially preventable childhood diseases. They said that the real cause of this was that mothers were in weakened condition from malnutrition, from malaria, from diarrhea, from schistosomiasis. They said that there were no midwives or birth attendants. They said that they didn't have even basic clinics in the small villages with the most uh, elementary drugs. They knew that we weren't going to use the $2 million to build a fancy hospital with and bring doctors in, but they had some suggestions for us, and we, we frankly took their cue. And so we put together emergency feeding programs, especially for children, for pregnant women, and for lactating women. We supported training for midwives and community health workers. We built and we stocked village huts uh, with health equipment. We drilled some boreholes in order to provide clean water. And over the course of the next two years, we monitored the progress, we made course corrections, and most of all, we listened to them, the women involved, as they told us where we were doing the right thing and where we were making mistakes. And by the time I left the Central African Republic two and a half years later, we could already see a marked decline in infant mortality, and in maternal mortality. And knowing that my work, in part, had helped women and children thrive and survive, I was hooked. I was hooked on the role of women in development. I was hooked on the concept of development itself. And frankly, I was hooked on USAID. 
uh, over the course of what was indeed a 30-year career, I had the opportunity to work in Brazil, in Malaysia, in Mauritius, South Africa, Angola, and Haiti. And I saw these same lessons come time and time again. And in fact, as I said, there is something very special about working for an agency whose day job it is to address global hunger through the President's Feed the Future initiative, to attack infant mortality and maternal mortality through the Global Health Initiative, to combat climate change and assist uh, both adaptation and remediation, to help those who are suffering from displacement as a result of conflict or natural disaster, and to help build stable democracies and resilient societies. And least you believe that this is a fool's errand, we actually, over the course of the last two decades, have achieved some pretty remarkable things as a global community. There has been more progress in the area of development in the last two decades than at any other point in world history. In that period alone, we have collectively moved 600 million people from extreme poverty across the poverty line. Incomes, real incomes, have risen by 60%. We've slashed infant mortality rates by a third. Democracy is burgeoning. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, two decades ago, we were working with three democracies. Today, there are more than 20. And never before have so many globally of our partners been democracies and thus reflect the actual will of the population. That said, we're humbled by the task we have ahead of us. Uh, as we look at the challenges of disease and illiteracy and unemployment, uh, corruption, bad governance, food insecurity, climate change, we know that the world that we're operating in has fundamentally changed. And I want to spend much of my comments talking about the new world of development in which we're trying to accomplish these changes. The first way in which things have changed, you hear about every day, and that is the tightness of our budgets now. We're in a brand new world where we have to make every dollar count. More and more around the world, we are hearing about the need for effectiveness and accountability and transparency, attention to potential corruption. Members of Congress and the American people are still very generous with our budgets but they want to know that we're using our resources to help countries move beyond foreign assistance, to join the South Africas and the Brazils and the Indias that are sustaining their own development drives. Secondly, however, donor governments' contributions just aren't as important in the development arena as they used to be. In broad terms, the United States uh, government is providing about $30 billion worth of development assistance each year. And yes, I will remind you, that's less than 1% of the total budget. It's actually an interesting uh, analysis because when they do polling, the average American believes somewhere between 20 and 25% of our budget is in foreign assistance. Mm -hmm. And they always tell us that what they really would like to see is between 5 and 7%. And I always say, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <Give> it. <laughs> but, but if the U.S. government is spending $30 billion on development, private Americans through charities, NGOs, religious organizations give $40 billion each year to international development and relief. Remittances from Americans to these countries are $100 billion each year. And private investment to these countries is a trillion dollars each year. And so, in fact, the $30 billion that we're providing has to be used in new ways, in innovative ways. And what we're doing is trying to use our resources as catalysts we're trying to leverage other people's monies. We're trying to reduce risk for investors or for non-governmental organizations to invest their resources. We're using our convening authority to draw people together. And perhaps most importantly, we're prepared to take some calculated risks ourselves. 
where the market doesn't allow that. You know, that notion of partnership goes beyond even money. I was really pleased at the Rio Plus 20 conference last year to be able to announce an initiative that we're working on whereby we've linked up with the Global uh, Consumer Goods Forum. And this is a, a group that represents 450 companies, all the big consumer goods companies, $3.1 trillion worth of sales each year, Coca-Cola, Unilever, colgate Palmolive, et cetera. And they agreed that if we would partner with them, they would eliminate net deforestation in their supply chain for palm oil, for paper, for beef, and soybeans by the year 2020. The only reason they did that, well, that's not true. The, the main reason that they wanted to partner with us was that we offered them the opportunity to announce this at the White House. And as we all know, the White House is the single biggest home court advantage in diplomacy and development. And again, this is real resources. These are real companies that are going to be changing their way of doing business because of the opportunity to partner. A third way in which the international development agenda has changed is that we're in an era of empowerment. We're reflecting what I like to call the democratization of development. Governments and civil societies around the world and our partner countries are no longer going to accept programs, policies, and guidelines made in America any more than they'll accept uh, policies made at the World Bank or in London or Beijing for that matter. They are demanding ownership over their own development drives and frankly, as more and more of these countries become democracies and their civil societies have voices in determining what the development priorities are, we are much more comfortable about it, working with them and following their development leads. The fourth point I wanted to make about the changes that have occurred directly relates to the, the question of international governance in this space because what we have found is that there's a growing consensus among donors, among recipients, among the entire set of partnerships over the discipline of development. What we're finding is when we go to international conferences, and the last important one was in Busan, Korea, about 16 months ago, there is a coalition coming together that says, we, we basically agree on what we need to do to, to, to encourage development. There's an understanding that we have to put results at the center of our collective development agenda. There's an understanding that all of our populations are demanding tough monitoring uh, mechanisms and accountability. There's a new focus on transparency, and frankly, the United States government has uh, reflected that. We now put on our website what we call the dashboard, every single project that we are doing in development all around the world. We've also signed on to the IATI agreement, which imposes transparency upon ourselves. This was after about 10 years of not signing on, and we did that at Busan. Also at Busan, there was an, an understanding that this is not just a question of the traditional donors. We have emerging donors, whether it's China or India or Brazil, who were brought under the tent of the development world. We also, for the first time at Busan, had the opportunity to talk about the special requirements of fragile states. If you think about the Millennium Development Goals and the achievements that we made under that, it is useful to remember not, not a single MDG goal has been met in any fragile state around the world. And as recently as a couple of years ago, when I led a U.S. delegation to Ankara for the Least Developed Countries Conference, they wouldn't even let me mention the word fragility 
it was somehow considered an insult. And now we have countries self-defining as fragile in order to have special privileges and special opportunities in the international community. And a conference in Monrovia laid the groundwork for this, and we now have a new deal for fragile states that's been adopted internationally. And in that context, we reaffirmed our commitment to disaster risk reduction so that countries are prepared when the natural disasters hit and the whole concept of resiliency. Finally, I wanted to highlight what I frankly spend most of my time on, and that is the concept of inclusive development. That is a concept that has basically two, two principles. One is that development needs to occur in ways that matters to the local population. If you think about the Arab Spring, for example, Egypt enjoyed for the past decade 6 and 8 and 10 percent growth rates, very solid growth. Much of the developing world has experienced positive growth rates of that kind. And yet in Egypt, that growth did not generate jobs. It was not equally distributed. It was subject to corruption. It didn't lead to <coughs> health care and housing and education for the average Egyptian. And as a result, we had a social revolution that derived largely from economic and social issues. And so development is much more than 6 and 8 and 10 percent growth rates. It has to reflect a real concept of human security and human development in addition to simple growth. But what inclusive development also means is that previously marginalized groups have to be at the table have to be planners, have to be beneficiaries, have to be implementers of all the development that occurs in those countries. And again, this means women, it means people with disabilities, the LGBT community, it means indigenous populations, it means displaced people. And if for some reason you think that those are sort of side parts of the population, just remember, the groups I just mentioned represent 85% of the population in developing countries. The way I like to sum this up is development is now a whole of society exercise, where indeed these groups are planners, implementers, and beneficiaries, where we listen to them. We have a phrase that people at AID are really tired of hearing me say, which is nothing about them without them. Let them guide you. Let them tell you what they need. I guess the final area that I wanted to talk about just briefly is the incorporation of science and technology and innovation in everything we're doing at USAID. And, you know, I came back after 30 years in the government. I was in the NGO world for six years. I came back into government. I spoke French. I spoke Portuguese, I spoke Malay, but I felt like I had to go through a new language training, and that was the language of technology. You know, everybody around me was talking about crowdsourcing, grand challenges, data paloozas, hackathons. You know, I used to think hackers were bad people, and now we're working with an organization that calls itself Random Hacks of Kindness. Uh, one of the other things that we have to recognize in this space is that it is students who are and, and researchers at the universities who are coming up with the ideas that are going to drive this development uh, agenda that we have. And I just wanted to talk about a few of the, the projects that we're now working with students around the country on. Um, and the first one comes from an area where uh, Mark and I uh, work together, and that is the area of fighting trafficking in persons. And so at the University of Denver, there are students who have now linked with seven other universities, and they're populating a database whereby you can take your cell phone, walk into Walmart, put it up against, or Target or anyone, put it up against a barcode, and you look at it, and it will tell you how much traffic labor was involved in producing that product. 
And if you think about the impact of that on people's buying decisions, but beyond that, upon the socially responsible companies that sure don't want that reputation, we're going to see major changes in that area. If this is successful, and we have every expectation it will be, we're going to start applying it to child labor. We're going to start applying it to conflict minerals. We're going to basically create a socially responsible index. And again, it is students around the country who came up with the idea, who made it work, and who are now populating the database. A second uh, project that we're working on with some students, uh, I, anyone who's spent the amount of time in Africa that I have uh, knows very well the challenges of malaria. I've had it eight times. And the worst moments when you face the disease are between the time when you think you have it and the time you get that test back that says yes. Because, in fact, you don't want to take that curative dose unless you really have to. And yet, in some cases, cerebral malaria, for example, you'll die in 24 hours. So what some students did was to say, hey, we may not have clinics everywhere around the world. We may not have testing facilities. But there are 6.5 billion cell phones in the world right now. And if we can figure out an appropriate lens to put on the cell phone, you can simply take a picture of a blood smear, send it off to a clinic, and within five minutes you can find out whether you have malaria or tuberculosis or, or any of the major diseases that you can test uh, with blood samples. We're testing it right now. It's a little bit too expensive as a lens right now, but we're working on it with these students, and I think it's going to work. And the bottom line is it will save tens of thousands of lives all around the world. The final area that I, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, is some work we're doing with MIT and Berkeley. Where, where, and, and I don't know that this is actually the story, but I've been told this, that some students at MIT were sitting around uh, just drinking uh, water. And the kid from Bangladesh wasn't, wasn't drinking the water. And the other students said, well, why not? What's going on here? Why? And he said, well, you don't understand. In my country, every kid grows up seeing a glass of water as suspect. And in particular, it's because there's arsenic in, in drinking water in Bangladesh. And the students said, well, that's ridiculous. We, we should be able to do something about that. So they sat for three weeks and developed a filtration system that you can put on pumps that will filter out the arsenic before it comes up to the, the water basis. It takes time. It's uh, fairly expensive at this point. But again, it's going to work. And it will prevent child stunting and death from arsenic poisoning in Bangladesh and other countries around the world. And again, these are just students who, you know, are not playing computer games and instead engaged in these exercises. And we have a variety of programs that we're doing right now uh, called Grand Challenges or Tech Challenges, where we are challenging American students and students from around the world <clears throat> in such areas as how can you save lives during the first 48 hours after birth? What can you come up with in that area? How can you reduce the amount of energy required to produce a certain amount of food? How can you improve reading skills? How can you develop technology that will hold governments accountable to their people? This is a program we call Making All Voices Count. And we're spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars on these efforts and they are showing immediate results. You know, I started with my story about the Central African Republic, which is the first trip I took overseas. So I want to finish by talking about the last trip I just took, and that was to uh, Central America, where one of the programs that we have implemented that I'm very proud of 
is a program to attack domestic and sexual violence among women. You may know that in Guatemala, as recently as three years ago, it was not a crime to beat your wife. Domestic violence was not criminalized. It was considered to be a social uh, phenomenon. In addition, in Guatemala, they have had the highest rate of femicide in the world. Violence against women is just prevalent following the 25 years of violence that permeated that society. And so one of the things that we've done is link up with the attorney general in uh in Guatemala, who frankly just was honored here at Georgetown about three weeks ago uh, with the starting of your new center on, uh, on women, peace, and security. What we did with her was to help her build what she calls the 24-hour court. And it's a building in downtown Guatemala City. And you walk in the center, and if you turn to the right, you go to a normal sort of police and judge process. If you turn to the left, the first person you meet is a doctor who's going to help you with the domestic violence you faced. Then you meet a policeman who's going to take your story. Then you go to see a judge and you enter the, the, uh, the charge. Then you go to see a psychosocial counselor and then you go to see a sort of counselor who's going to tell you what you, sh you can do, you know, go off to a safe house, stay with friends. Come. And as you walk in that place, you look at that first stand, and then you look at the last stand, and the difference in the women is just amazing. It's like they're, they, they have been brought back from the dead. And then after looking at that, I went up to a, a small village called Nabaj. And in that village, we have been working with indigenous women who have stepped forward to fight domestic violence in their community, which was rampant. And they are mostly illiterate women, but they are petitioning the government. They are protesting in the streets. They are doing uh, mass strikes, consumer strikes, to influence businesses to be supportive. And it is changing that culture. But what was most significant for me was that the, towards the end of that, that lunch with them, a man stood up. And he said, you know, I joined this group two years ago because when I was a boy, I used to watch my dad beat my mother. And I was powerless to do anything about it. I was emasculated. And so when I grew up, in order to prove that I was a man, I started beating my wife. He said, I knew this was wrong. I joined this group two years ago. My wife gave birth to a boy last year, and I held that son in my arms, and I said, enough is enough. This stops with me. And he said he had not engaged in domestic violence since then, and that his life had been transformed by that process. And so if you ever don't think that development matters, if you ever start to get discouraged about the impact that you can have on lives around the world, just remember the women in the marketplace of the Central African Republic or that man in Nabaj, Guatemala. Thank you.